gospel is all about. It's reconciling man to God. Our whole series is based in a passage from 2 Corinthians that talks about the work that Christ has done for us and that that's made a way for us to be connected to God again. And then it says that he's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation, which means that we actually play a role in the kingdom of God and we actually can participate in the work that God is doing in people's hearts. So today, I want to give us some time to prepare our hearts to receive, to listen, to be taught, to be challenged. And uh, as we do so, I want to give you time to pray, just in the quietness of your heart. I'm going to kind of lead us through some some, some time right now. And uh, I just hope that you can take some deep breaths, engage with this time, lean into some prayer, and prepare to receive. So as we begin, let's just pray together. God, we are so excited to continue to learn and to grow as sons and daughters of God. We pray that you would speak to us in this new series and that we would have listening ears that are open to hear your voice. And we just want to take some time to prepare now. In Jesus' name. Every single one of us has a story of God working in our lives, whether or not we know it. And I want you to take some time right now to say thank you, to start with a prayer of thanksgiving for something that God has done in your life, for the reconciliation that, that Christ has made possible for you. Just something along those lines, whatever's on your heart, just take a sec, I'm gonna step back, just take a sec and pray in thanksgiving.
seated. Welcome to worship, Pastor Rob. Glad that you are here with us in this room today and those of you listening online as well. It's great to be here this morning. As Colin said, and we prayed a few minutes ago, we are launching a new series, starting a new series today called Reconciled, and I'm looking forward to opening that series this morning. But I'm here to tell you that next Sunday, the 18th of April, uh, a guy named Daniel Babui, who some of you would know, if we've talked about him some, sent out some information on him, he is our, our candidate for Senior Director of Discipleship, a new important role in the ministry of our church. So he's going to be speaking here, uh, taking you know the second installment of this message, a series of this series titled The Message to Reconciled to God. You'll be able to see him, meet him, little meet and greet after the services and listen to him, and uh, I think there's going to be a, a gospel presentation central to the, the message that we had planned for this day, so I want to let you know about that. And then Tuesday, two days later, which is April the 20th, in this very room, especially, you're all welcome, especially the members, we're going to put forth him as our candidate for your approval to be a member of our staff, so that's very exciting. Two other things also will happen on the 20th, um, I'll be meeting with the congregational meeting. One is a parking lot renovation. We've been talking about this really ever since probably 19, or 19, wow, <laughs> 2015. Um, who says 19 anymore, I should remember. Um, since 2015 or 16, we probably first started talking about our Village of the Reach initiative, but we're finally ready to do it. I mean, a major renovation. We have the money, thanks to you all, so we want to approve that. If you approve that, uh, our, uh, our uh, engineers and, uh, and uh, teams tell us that they're going to do this work that it probably could be done as soon as the 4th of July, so that's huge. That's just not a, you know, put a coat, top coat on this, but it's a, a, a true renovation. It's got some bad spots in our parking lot. Ian, also Jason Harris, our, our director of worship here, is going to uh, be put forth for licensure, which expands his ministry muscles a little bit here. So we want to put those three things before you on the 20th, but it all starts with Daniel Kabui, who will be here next week, so I'm very excited about that. Let me say this as we get ready to pray for our offering. You know, it's been an amazing year. Here we are in, uh, you know, coronavirus isn't over, but it seems like we're moving our way out of it. But it's been one of the most difficult years for any organization, business, church, too. And you guys have outperformed, you know, the year before. And if you, I'm talking about giving, and have you not outperformed, even if those of you, many of you haven't even been here, you've continued to faithfully give to this church, we wouldn't be hiring anybody. We wouldn't be fixing any parking lot. We wouldn't be doing the ministry that we're doing, but we can because of your faithfulness and giving to the ministry. So I want to thank you. We want to thank you as leaders. Thank you for your faithfulness. Let's pray. God and Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We do want to experience more and more of the gospel in our hearts and lives, even in this service and in this season. I thank you for, Lord, all that you have given to us. We now give back to you uh, our, our tithe, our offerings.
Someone said I should be dancing from now. <laughs> the Bible, as you've heard before, maybe, is the story of the Bible is a, is a rescue mission. Really, we're talking about the whole story if you were to read it cover to cover. And the story of the, this rescue mission, it's it's God had this purpose, original purpose in creation. We looked at this even in the book of Genesis, if those of you who were here in this last fall, read the book of Genesis, parts of last year. We looked at the original purpose. You know, God created humanity, men and women, in his image. And that's just not that it doesn't mean you look like God, you know, sort of two eyes, two, two ears, and another. It's, it's, it has to do with his character, and it was a purpose statement. God created, we were created in God's image, but that image was damaged by sin. But in Jesus Christ, this is the gospel, God is inviting the world back to himself. Okay, reconciled. But he's not just inviting him back to himself like you were sinners and I want to forgive your sin. Yes, that's part of it. But he's inviting men, women, people, humanity back to the original purpose for which humanity was created. Okay, We are to be a people who have a restored image, who engage the world in a distinctive way that demonstrates the gospel's power and the gospel's credibility. How are people supposed to know, I'm talking about people who are non-believers, who have not received the gospel, how are they supposed to know that the gospel is something they're supposed to respond to, that, is, that demonstrates a different way of life? It comes through the restored image in the way they see it in our lives. That's what it means to be the, an image bearer, like an ambassador we'll see in this passage. It means I'm representing. It's not just, here's a message, I have some words for you. I'm supposed to demonstrate a quality of life, the image of God, that by itself is something different, something that's attractive, something that's true. Okay? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, the word reconcile, uh, that's the title of this series, evokes a lot of different meaning in our day, especially right? immediately you think of racial reconciliation, big word in our day, um, marital reconciliation, uh, relational reconciliation political reconciliation. All big ideas, all in, relevant to our world that we live in today, but the, in the New Testament, the word reconciliation, we'll see this in just a second, is the primary word, the big word, there are many, but I would say this is sort of the one that, in, that, that is the umbrella of them all, that talks about the actual mission of the church, okay, that Jesus Christ came to inaugurate. The mission of the church. In Jesus Christ, we'll see this in a sec, God is not only reconciling us back to himself, he's reconciling us back to a calling that was originally given in the first uh, creation of Genesis chapter 1. So let's take a look at this by way of introduction. Uh, if you have a copy of the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll look at verses 13 through 20, and a message titled, Reconciled to a New Way of Life. Reconciled to a New Way of Life way of life. The Bible says in these words, if we are out of our mind, Apostle Paul speaking, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You know, when I first went to a seminary, the question came up, I'm sure it's been coming up forever, was, you know, did the Bible writers, that is, you know, Paul and Peter and John and, and James, etc., and did they know when they were writing these letters to churches and to, you know, individuals, did they know they were writing the scriptures, that they were writing the word of God? And the answer to that, I think, overwhelmingly from 
from even a Bible uh, scholar, so to speak, was no, of course they didn't know. That. How could they possibly know back then when they were in the midst of this amazing situation, the world had changed, Christ had come, they had been anointed, they had been called, and what they're doing, if you, if you read the letters carefully, including this one, they're really writing, um, it's, 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 I don't think there's a lot of thought that went to it in the sense of they didn't go to a, a, a library to write these things. These were about particular problems. Sometimes the problems in this letter had to do with the way people were, what they believed. There was some you know, messy morality going on, taking people to court. There were, there were theological issues. There were all kinds of opposition and persecution. These were letters that were written maybe, you know, maybe in a, you know, not on a napkin, but whatever the next version is. We need to get these letters. We need to communicate these truths to these congregations that are in some trouble, right? And then I would admit that these guys, the, 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 the people who wrote the scriptures understood that this was eventually going to be called the canon, eventually it was going to be called the Bible or the Word of God, that the words that they were writing in these letters were going to be put together in what would be called uh, the greatest selling book of all time, they might have thought twice about some of the things they said, right? They would have maybe tried to clean it up as I would. And one of the things that was written to the Apostle Paul, we know there's another letter that was from the congregation to him, and it says what we say, what was mentioned in this very first passage, is that Paul, right, it's almost like someone said to me, you're out of your mind. Right? Paul says, they said, listen, we appreciate uh, your teaching ministry to us, but you are out of your mind. And they thought he was out of his mind, that's why he responds to it in the 13th verse, because he was talking about what had taken place in his life. He said there was something that had radically happened, a change had taken place in his life. That was so radical. And he was telling them about the change that had taken place in his life. He said, listen, this change that has taken place in my life, that has taken root in my life, should also take place in your lives and in the lives of all people who name the name of Christ. And they said, Paul, you are out of your mind. Kind of three things quickly from this passage relative to this new way of life that happened to Paul and supposed to be happening to us. The first one is a new way of seeing. Paul said, let me tell you about what has happened to me and what should happen to all people who are open to the gospel. It's a new way of seeing. I want you to think about this. The Apostle Paul, some of you know this, some of you don't. Um, his, his testimony, if I want to use those words. When Paul first met Jesus Christ, this is what was going on in his life. He was, he, was not, he, was a, he was a serious Jewish member of the Sanhedrin, a, a ruling council. He was a, he was a serious minister of the Jewish people. And he was dismissive of Jesus, like a lot of them were. And Jesus had already died and, and, and was off the scene. And the, and the little anemic church started and happened. He started to grow a church of Jesus Christ. And Paul was on a mission with letters and documentation from the, from the major, um, from, the, from the, the Jewish leadership on a mission to seek out, to hunt out, to smoke out the disciples of Jesus Christ and kill them, okay? If you're a note taker, Acts chapter nine. He said, Paul was sent on a mission to find these people, to arrest them, and some cases to kill the disciples of Jesus. And while he's on one of those journeys, Acts chapter nine, on, in the outside of, of, of Damascus, a light comes from the sky. This blinding light happens. It's overwhelming. It is an amazing kind of phenomenon. It's so overwhelming that Paul, his name's called Saul at that time, he falls on his, on his back, literally. It just blows him away. He's on the ground. And while he's on the ground in this blinding light, he hears a voice. And it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says to himself, first of all, what in the world is going on? Who are you? Right? What do you mean persecuting you? He might be thinking, this might be the devil talking to me, because he was on a mission, so he thought from God, from the leaders in Jerusalem, out to stamp out this, this sort of heretic who was called Jesus and his followers. He was doing God's work. Who are you? And he said, the voice said, I am Jesus. And the people that you are harming, the people that you're arresting, the people that you are killing, they belong to me. Now, when that happened, the light goes away, Paul's blind, and they help him up, and they have to hold him by the hand, and they walk into this house, not far from where they were, and for three days, Paul sits in the dark, no food, tells you, no water, no one talks to him for three days. 
Now imagine what was taking place in Apostle Paul's heart during those three days. I would imagine he was rethinking his entire life. I don't know if you've had one of these moments. This wasn't just he had a bad day, he, he overspent, he overshot, you know, he, he, he asked out the wrong girl, he, he took the wrong job. This was a guy whose whole life was devoted. He was a devoted person. He was a, you know, he was a head above everyone else in his class. He was a serious, devoted person in the teachings of the Old Testament. He was a professional, a rabbi, so to speak, and he was doing God's work, or so he thought, and in this moment he realizes. Not only was he not working for God, he was working against God, and by the way, he had blood on his hands. Imagine that. For three days, I don't know if you've ever had this kind of moment in your life, even in a smaller way, where you said, what in the world was I thinking? How did I get here? Everything my life has been about has been wrong. Right? Wow. At the end of three days, he gets a knock at the door. It's not the police, which could have been, right? He was doing things that were illegal and I'm speaking. It was not the police. It was not the Grim Reaper. It was a guy named Ananias who was a disciple of Jesus. And he said, listen, the same voice, Paul, that talk, you talked to three days ago, that same Jesus sent me to you to do a couple things. I want to heal your blindness. I want to baptize you. And I want to see you experience the Holy Spirit. All those things happened. Paul, Paul had his eyesight back. He received the Holy Spirit. He had a meal. He had a good night's sleep. And he went out that very next day and started to preach the gospel. He became an apostle. And he went from despising Jesus, literally despising. He wasn't just a crank or a critic. He was out there killing people who were following Jesus. He went from doing that to being overwhelmed with gratitude. Why? Because of the love that he experienced when God came out and his door. Right? There is nothing so powerful Nothing so great, no motivation so strong than knowing that someone loves you, especially God. And when Paul had this experience, the love of God became the controlling center of his life. He no longer saw the world, right? It's a new way of seeing it. Through his ambitions, through his judgments, through his fears, through his politics, he saw the world through the gospel that had just radically changed his life. Right? Ernest Hemingway, um, who's been you know, um, celebrated, he's watching this documentary lately. Someone asked Ernest Hemingway if he um, ever got writer's block. And Ernest Hemingway said, yes, I did. I'm this great writer, 20th century writer. He said, yes, I did. And they said, what'd you do about it? He said, I would always do the same thing. Every one of my books, I would start with this one mission. I wanted, to, I wanted to write the truest sentence I could write. He said, all I wanted to do, I wanted to write one true sentence. And I would keep working at it and keep working at it. You know, get rid of all the ornamentation. Get rid of all the elaborate introduction. I just wanted to write one straightforward, simple, declarative sentence. The truest sentence I could write. And then I would go from there. When it comes to 2 Corinthians, this particular important time in this letter, I think Paul says, verse 16, from now on, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, not even Jesus. I see people in a completely different way, no longer through my ambitions, not no longer through my judgments, no longer through my fears, no longer through my politics, but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you say, Rob, how about you? Is that easy? No. None of us are there, <laughs> including this pastor. But this is where your faith is leading you. This is where your faith is leading me. Starts with a new way of seeing. Secondly, Paul says, this new life, it goes from a new way of seeing to a new way of being. Okay? A new way of being. This new creation, old things pass away. All things are become new. We are new creatures. He uses that word on purpose, by the way, because he's trying to contrast it to the old creation. That is to say, the creation in Genesis 1, made in the image of God, that was damaged by sin. Jesus Christ came back not just to save me from my sins, to save you, to forgive you, but to restore the image that had been damaged. And with that image comes a purpose. Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28, right? I want you to rule 
able to do. I want you to go out in the world, be my ambassador. I want you to show people not just by what you say, but the quality of the way you live, what it means to believe in the kingdom of God. Okay? So that's what Jesus Christ came to do. And this new creation not only changed, not only reconciled God and humanity, it's supposed to reconcile humanity, individuals, with each other. Those who have been truly, those who have been truly reconciled to God through Christ have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are also supposed to become reconcilers with each other. Jesus died not just to forgive us of our sins, but to bring about the death of self-centered living. Verse 15, those who should live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. He came to bring the death of self-centered living and the judgments that come with it. Listen, we all have judgments. Every person. It's the nature of life. They come from our experiences. They come from our, our, our biases. They come from our prejudices. Exposing those to the gospel is the work of discipleship, is the ongoing work of reconciliation. And if you don't think that this is a hard work or difficult work, you haven't followed it very deeply. You know, one of the most important chapters, again, by way of introduction, reconciled to a new way of life, one of the most important chapters in the Bible, I would say the whole New Testament in general, but on this subject, is Acts chapter 10. Now, in Acts chapter 10, maybe if you have a copy of the Bible, sometimes they put um, titles on there that are not part of the scripture, but they're supposed to be helpful. Often it'll say, the conversion of Peter, Acts chapter 10. But the conversion of Peter, Acts chapter 10, is not talking about Peter when he became a Christian. It happened a long time ago when he was hanging out with Jesus. It's talking about when Peter, this is what they, you know, after the fact, it's when Peter started to see and live. Right? He didn't. He, it's, it's when Peter finally began to have his life change. You know, when I, when I, when I first, um, and, and, and what also happens there? Why is Acts chapter ten so important? It's the first Gentile person becoming a Christian. Okay, the very first time a a non-Jewish person becomes a Christian in the in the Bible's record is in Acts chapter ten. It's a Roman soldier named Cornelius. But why is this so interesting? Why do we call it the conversion of Peter? Here's why. Because Peter, Jesus had already died, rose, and before he ascended, he sat down with the disciples. Many of you know this. The, at Matthew chapter 28, Acts chapter, we call it the Great Commission of the Mission of the Church. He says, listen, friends, first it's the 12 minutes, 120 men and women in Acts chapter 1. They, their hearts have been for, liberated. The, the sins of the, they had been forgiven. They had this new power, this new joy. He said, listen, this joy, this power, this gospel, I want to go give it to you so you can go bring it to all the world. He says very specifically, go into all the nations, teaching them, baptizing them, all the nations of the earth to obey what I command. Now go, and then he says it a second time in Acts 1, he gives it in a different way, a geographic way. Start in Jerusalem, then go to Judea, then go to Samaria, and then go to the uttermost parts of the world. Okay? Wow. Amen, Jesus. We're going to do it. Now, not only did Jesus give them this very, very super clear presentation to go beyond the Jewish people, but he even modeled it in his own life. Sometimes we forget this. This is what Peter was thinking in his dark hours in the manner of speaking in Acts 10. Peter, Jesus was the one who healed the centurion's servant, who was a Roman. And he said, after he healed that servant, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. He said that to his disciples, and this guy was a Roman soldier. Jesus is the one that went to the Syrophoenician town, Tyre. It gets in Matthew 15. He went where people didn't, and Jews would never go, to Tyre, which was like, you know, sin city. And he went there and healed a woman and said, this is what I'm about. He's the one, of course, right? When the disciple went to get some groceries, Jesus, you can never keep him, um, you know, on the track. And he went and talked to this woman of Samaria. 
and he gave her this long message. And not only did he open himself up to her, and in that time and season, not only were the Samaritans the most despised people in Israel, women were at the bottom of the ladder. And Jesus says, I'm making a point. He not only opened his life to her, she became a Christian, the whole town became Christians. But even though Jesus gave them this great commission to go to all the nations of the world, even though Jesus modeled in his life prior even to his death and resurrection that the gospel is for all nations, for many, many years after Jesus rose, all of the 12 disciples, including Peter, who was the champion, stayed in Jerusalem, even though the church had gone from 120 to probably 10,000, if you did the math in the book of Acts. Almost all of them stayed in Jerusalem, and every last one of them was Jewish. Why? Why is Acts chapter 10 one of the most important chapters in the Bible? Because they, they weren't getting the message. They were Christians, but they weren't living like ones. So Peter gets this vision. It's a whole sermon in itself. Three times he gets this vision, and the vision he gets is, a, is, a, is this, it's, he says, it's in a dream, it's these animals that come at him, and many of them are unclean. In other words, they're not kosher. You're not supposed to eat these kind of foods. And the vision says, Peter, rise, kill, eat. And Peter thinks it's a test, and he says, no, I never would do that. And he says, Peter, rise, kill him. Three times he gets the vision. Peter says to God, who's giving him these words, no, no, no. And God finally says, what, what God has cleansed, do not call impure. And clearly these animals were representing people. But Peter still didn't get it. And the, finally the Spirit spoke to him in Acts 10. It said, just when the people knock on your door, go with them. And this is what happens. Just read a few verses of Acts 10. Peter says, okay, I'm going to go because the Lord told me to. Verse 27. He takes a ride to Caesarea, which is where God had called him, to meet this Roman soldier named Cornelius, the first non-Jewish person to become a Christian many, many years after Jesus Christ had already risen from the dead. While talking with him, Peter, speaking of Cornelius, Peter went inside the house. In front of a large gathering of people, he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Wait a minute. What law is he talking about? It's not, it's not the law of Jesus. Jesus didn't lay down. Jesus, Jesus' law was the exact opposite. Jesus said, listen, go into all the world, including centurion, Roman soldiers, and, and Africans, and China, go everywhere. And guess when Jesus had given that message? A dozen years before. Was Peter a Christian? Of course he was a Christian. He just raised, he, he, he helped raise some, rose someone from the dead in chapter 9. Was the power of God in Peter's life? Absolutely. Was Peter a Christian? Yes. Was he living like one? Not so much. Peter said, listen, it's against our law. Now, someone was really thinking, they said, well, wait a minute, Peter, I thought you were an apostle of the church. The law he's talking about is the Jewish law, which even though he was a born-again Christian, that was still the modus operandi of his life, right? Look at verse 34. When then Peter began to speak, he's in the house now, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. What? Think about that, friends, if you know the story of the New Testament. I now realize Jesus had come, Sermon on the Mount's over, feeding the 5,000 is over, the miracles are over, the great teaching is over, the, 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 the open the giving of the Holy Spirit is over. The Peter, the church is launched. All this great stuff is happening. And Peter says, listen, a dozen years later, I now realize it's dawned on me that God does not show favoritism to Jewish people, but that the gospel can go to anyone who fears God. Really? How is it possible that you hung out with Jesus, you listened to the gospel, you experienced the descent of the Holy Spirit, you did many, many miracles, preached great sermons, and you didn't understand what it really meant to be a Christian, right? It starts with a new way of seeing, and that's a new way of being, right? 
It's in the way. It's the only time I first became a Christian, or I should say Christian, a Christian minister. Came out of seminary. It was in my first uh, church. And um, I, I, this was, you know, many years ago, I had this, I, I was reading this chapter. That's why I said it's one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And I had this epiphany, the one I'm kind of sharing with you right now. I had this epiphany when I thought about Peter. I thought about this whole situation. I thought, God, I'm not spent all these years studying the Bible, sitting there thinking, how is it possible that the apostle Peter, the head of the apostles, was blind? Yes, he was, God used him in mighty ways, he preached these great messages, he was the, he was the chief apostle, and yet for years after Jesus rose from the dead, he was blind, he wasn't really living like a Christian. I said, how is that possible? But I'm a Christian, I'm even in the ministry, right? So I said to myself, and although my life had changed, right, I would say, although I would become a better version of myself, I realized I didn't become a whole new person yet. All right, it was very sober moment. Around that time, my pastor at the time, I was a, like an associate minister, he said, Rob, would you speak three or four weeks from now? I've got a poll in the camera, would you speak? Not only did I say yes, I said, I know exactly what I'm going to talk about. I was so fired up that this is it. This is it. Acts chapter 10, this is the moment. we got to do it. But I, but I realized that... My, my insight was far ahead of my own life, right? So I said, what am I going to, I got to find some way to communicate to people that we have got to change. So I called this guy who I had met as a seminary student who, who gave, you know, not free, but kind of cheap haircuts to graduate students. And, you know, he put up on a bulletin board and I called him and said, Armand, listen, you've got to help me. He said, yeah, what do you want? He was a Christian guy. He said, I said, this sounds crazy, but I'm going to preach this sermon on Sunday. I want you to bleach my hair blonde. <laughs> and at the time, not so much now, I had this full head of jet black hair. I said, I want you to bleach my hair blonde. And it was a crazy idea. He didn't care why. Because I said, that I want to be able to walk into this room and say to people, we have got to change. So she was taking him on over. This is the day before, 24 hours before the sermon. So I come over to his house. He says, first of all, Rob, I'm not going to bleach your hair. Because that's a very involved process. And it takes, it's very messy, it's very difficult, it's damaging, and um, there's no turning back. Okay? So he said, but I got this other, you know, easy product, this sort of 24-hour thing or whatever. And I'll, I said, fine, do it. I'm just going to spray it in. So I sit down. He does this whole thing. It took no time, half an hour. By the time, he, I don't think my head is even dry. I'm looking in the mirror at myself. This is the dumbest idea. <laughs> this is crazy. Not only does that look ridiculous, but it's actually working against the point that I want to make, which is that the real Christianity is not a change of clothes. So we laughed our heads off. I said, I'm going to get that stuff out of my mind. <laughs> but, okay, we did it, thank God. Mostly, thank God. But if nothing else, it helped me mark the beginning of a journey when I realized there's a difference between being a Christian and living like one. And the difference really is being committed more fully to my own reconciliation. And I thought, if Paul, the apostle, could be that blind, if Peter, oh my goodness, lived in breathe and hung out and ate dinner and listened to the Lord Jesus and was at Pentecost and gave all these sermons and experienced the forgiveness of God even in Acts in John 21. If this guy could go through all of it and still blinded by his judgments, blinded by his own experience. The gospel had, he was a Christian, but it hadn't penetrated to the deepest part of who he was. He looked out to the world and he couldn't say the truest sentence that I now see knowing from a worldly point of view. If that could happen to me, it could happen to you. It could happen to me. So here's a, a challenge I want to give. I thought, this is a question. It's kind of for today, but really I'd say it's for the whole series. Today's an introduction. Here's the question. I want you to ask yourselves. Do we want to be effective, I'm talking about you and me, but as a church, in changing hearts 
in making disciples, or are we content to reach the already converted? The people who maybe already are Christians, or they've already shared up home. Because this is what the early church did. The early church grew not by two or three, by ten. They were just helping some people connect some dots between Isaiah 53, let's say, in Matthew chapter 20. That's all they were doing. But the bigger dot connected between Matthew 28, what's Matthew 28? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. All the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 7, which says this. What does the church of Jesus Christ look like at the end of time? Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. That great vision had not moved one inch between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Acts chapter 10. Because even these great giants were blinded by their own judgments, their own fears, their own prejudice, and their own separate their agenda. And if you don't think that's going to happen to you, you're not being honest with yourself. But do we want to be effective in changing hearts in making disciples? If the answer to that is yes, instead of just reaching the already converted, then we have to change. Last point. It's a call to come over. This passage. You should think about this passage, or this, at least I stopped in verse 20. Here's what Paul does at the end. He's so smart, he's such a good writer and thinker. And he says, and he's 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 passionate about his own experience. See, when, you, when something really happens to you, when you have a foxhole, when you have a radical rethink, when you fall in love or whatever, when, when that really happens to you, you're an evangelist. You say, no, you're not hearing me. Right? This is Paul's having one of these moments. He's saying, listen, God has, has, has radically changed us. It's surgery. He goes inside the deepest part of who you are. He doesn't just forgive your sin, wipe off the, the, the you know, your, like, like it's a chalkboard. He doesn't just erase the bad things. He rewrites the truths of your heart. He rewires you. It's, it's in the image of God. We no longer see anyone. Paul says, I don't see the world the way I did at all. I see it through the lens of the gospel. And he's saying that God has reconciled us back to himself and back to this way of seeing and being. And he's saying to us, let's join arms and let's go be ministers of reconciliation, starting in our own communities with each other, right, but also with a lost community around us. But then there's this little pivot at the end of this passage, and he says, listen, I want you to be reconcilers. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, positive, as though God were making his appeal through us. On, we implore you, wow, all of a sudden he shifts and he's talking to them now. He implore you to be reconciled to God. Wait a minute. They're saying, we are Christians already. Why are you imploring us to be reconciled to God? He's saying, listen, it's not just about you. You have to come to the death of self-centered living. You have to be able to surrender. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4. We carry in our body the death of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Christ might be manifest in us. That's a fancy Bible way of saying the cross of Jesus Christ is doing continual work in your life if you're submitted to it. Putting to death your, your attitudes. Putting to death your prejudices. Putting to death your agenda and releasing through the gospel a new way of living and a new way of seeing. And Paul says, listen, God wants to make his appeal through you. God wants to make his appeal through me, but he's having a hard time right now getting past your judgments, getting past your agenda, getting past your fears. And so he says, listen, I implore you, on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. It has to start with us. So here's my final question by way of introduction for us this morning. Where in your life do you need to be reconciled more fully to God? Where in your life do you need to be more fully reconciled to God? Right? 
it's it's it, it's not a it's not a once in a lifetime experience. It just happened once. It happens over the course of your life. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the pastor, right? You have to come to the cross and say, Lord, there's areas in my life, right? I'm a Christian, but not ever, I'm not living my life. Where do you need to be more holy in this house of God in your life today? Let's pray. God, thank you for this message this morning. Thank you for the words of the apostle. We come to you, Lord, seeking your, Lord, your the Holy Spirit to do a deeper work in us, a deeper work in me. Begin with this pastor and begin with us as a congregation. Lord, help us to desire to be used of you, to change hearts, to make disciples, and not simply to reach the already converted. Lord, Holy Spirit, reveal in me. Search me and try me and see if there be any offensive way in me. Lead me into the way of the rest. And may that be so for everyone in this room, that we might become a growing see the world the way that you do more. We see people the way that you do. And Lord, you are willing to do whatever it takes, surrender whatever it means to be your servants in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Please join us next week as we celebrate some baptism.